Hey guys, welcome to the second half of chapter 11. In this part, we're going to talk about the other components of the membrane that are just as important as the phospholipids. So as I mentioned, we're gonna talk about membrane proteins. We're gonna talk about them a lot because they have a huge role in the cell function. And then we're gonna talk about membrane carbohydrates. And as I mentioned in the first part of this lecture, that this stuff may be new to you, but I also expect it to not be super challenging. So please let me know if you have any questions about any of it. Here are our objectives. If you have any questions, always just let me know. This is what I expect you to have mastered for the test and be able to discuss this. So first let's talk about membrane proteins. We're gonna talk about the importance of them, what some of their functions, what they're doing. We're gonna talk about their structures. We're gonna talk about how we extract them, study them, and then we're gonna talk about how, we, how they stabilize the membrane. So first let's talk about the importance of membrane proteins. Membrane proteins are really important because they provide a lot of functionality to the cell. And you can see the examples we have here. Now I don't expect you to have anything specifically memorized about any of these, but I do want you to understand the four main groups and what, they're do, what they do. The first of these is transporters. This is what allows things to come in and out of the cell. This is really important. We talked about with the membrane being responsible for creating a distinct separation from the outside environment and the inside environment. We have to have a way to bring in nutrients and get rid of waste as well as other things, but mainly nutrients and waste, big way to think about it. We also have anchors. This is what helps tie our cells to each other, helps stabilize the internal structures. They're really important. Receptors are even more important. This is how we discuss, interest, or this is how the cells get signals and understand what's going on in their environment. It's how they start feedback loops. Receptors are really, really important aspects of them. And then lastly, we have enzymes. And enzymes are another way in which the cells stimulate or can act and have things eventually happen within them that they need to have occur. And they can be stimulated from the outside of the cell as well as on the inside. So it's really important you understand these four main classes of, pro of membrane proteins and what they do. As I said, I'm not super worried about you understanding the exact examples that are provided here, but I want you to be able to list out all four of these and explain what they do. So we also have ways that they're associated with the membrane. So in the last slide we talked about what they do, but now let's talk about how they're in the membrane. One of the main things they do is a transmembrane. So you can see that they have two types of transmembranes mainly. We have the alpha helices where we can have multiple spanning um, transmembrane sections like you can see here there's one that has just one and one protein that's got three set transmembrane sections. There can be a whole bunch. There's a lot of pro uh, big class of proteins that have seven transmembrane spanning sections, but as I said, it just depends. We can also have ones that form pore-like structures, and you can see that there um, as the third example of a transmembrane. And these are all really important for conducting signals across the membrane. We then have monolayer associated ones. These are proteins that are only associated with either the inside or the outside of the cell, but don't span the whole thing, the whole membrane. And so it's just stuck on one side or the other. And then the last two are ones that are attached to the membrane in some way, shape, or form. We have lipid linked. So they're proteins that are attached to a lipid within the cell membrane. And then we have protein attached, which is where there's another protein that binds to one that's a transmembrane protein or something else that's attached to the membrane. So just like I just mentioned on the importance of membrane proteins and knowing what their functions are, it's important they understand how they can be associated with the membrane. So make sure that you have that, uh, that understanding that you are comfortable with these and you could be able to list these out because these are things I expect you to know. So how do we study these proteins? Well, what we do is we can break up the cell and study them. Now, obviously, as we've talked about over and over again this semester, and hopefully this is um, something you can recall easily, so that if the cell or if the protein is attached to the cell or attached to the membrane via something else, that would be an easy uh, a disassociation to make. So if it's a protein linked to a protein that's embedded in the cell, we could break that protein off easily and study that it's a peripheral membrane protein. We could study that easily. But what about those embedded ones? We have to use items known as detergents. And these detergents are like soaps. And what they do is they help break up that membrane and allow us to study the different um, proteins that are embedded so we can then separate out embedded proteins and then look at them. That implies that we know about all the membrane proteins in the cell and that we understand how they function and what they do in their total structure and everything like that. 
And it's not actually the case. We actually are not, we don't have a huge library of these membrane cells, of these uh, membrane proteins yet. We're still really working on them. We're still trying to learn what they do and how they work. But here's an example of one that we've worked out. Not only do we know the structure, but we know the function of it. Bacteria rhodopsin is a, a component in photosynthesis, and we'll talk about photosynthesis when we get there. But what I want you to see is that we have several transmembrane spinning sections on the protein that will cross from the extracellular space to the cytosolic space. And what it does is it allows for, member, for um, molecules to move through this protein and through the, um, through the membrane because of it. So it's really important to understand how this works. And this is just one example, as I said, of, a, of proteins that we've worked out. But we don't have a whole lot of them. Beyond allowing things to transport through, we also talked about how they're anchors and that proteins have to stabilize the membrane. Remember how we talked about in the first topic, how the membrane is fluid, it's always moving. Well, as you can imagine, that could start to cause a problem if it's just this crazy water balloon. So what we have is cytoskeleton that helps hold that in place. And that cytoskeleton anchors to the membrane via these proteins, and that's what helps stabilize the cell. Now, Remember, once again, because everything's so fluid, these proteins that are in the membrane can move around just as much as those lipids can. So it's really important for the cell to be able to help tie these down, these proteins, to make sure they're in specific places. Especially if you think about cells such as like gut cells. You clearly want one side of your cell that lines your gut to have different receptors than the ones that are on the inside of the, of the gut lining. And so what we do, or what the cell does, is it has a variety of ways to do that. And you can see the examples here. They can be tethered by a cell cortex on the inside. They can be tethered by something on the outside. They can be tethered to another cell. And then we also have diffusion barriers. We have tight junctions and other things that will stop the cell from diffusing across a specific area. So they can move across the whole section of the cell, but they can't cross this black, in this case, this black box on the cell. And this helps keep them in, on one side or the other and helps that cell have some kind of um, face to a specific environment that it needs to have and keep the proteins that are needed in another area in another area. Because as I said, it moves around. And I have a video in Blackboard that shows you some examples of how these membranes move around to give you some sense of that fluidity that we're talking about. So lastly, let's wrap up with membrane carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are just as important as proteins. Um, they just maybe don't have quite as many functional, uh, functions that we talk about as much because we don't work directly on carbohydrates generally. They're, um, they mostly modify other, uh, other molecules within the membrane. So we have glycolipids, which are lipids that are modified by the carbohydrates. We have glycoproteins, which are proteins modified by carbohydrates. And we have proteoglycans, which are proteins modified by a whole bunch of them. And so what these can do is they can create a variety of functionality within the cell. They can provide some structural protection by creating this carbohydrate layer on the outside of the cell. This can also make them slippery and help them move. And you can see an example on the bottom of this slide of, how, of a cell moving between other cells. And it's that slippery carbohydrate layer that allows for that to happen. They also provide cell recognition. This is one way that our immune system works, is it will go and it will touch all the other cells in our body to see if the, carbohydrate ma the carbohydrates are matching what they should be matching. So there's a variety of functions that they have, and, and make sure you understand that. And just like we talked about with the functionality of the proteins, I want you to understand what the point of carbohydrates are. But it's important to understand how this all works. And these are always on the non-cytosolic side of the plasma membrane. You can see an example, as you see that in the picture here. So just to wrap up, we did proteins and carbohydrates. Make sure you understand what they do and how they do it, and as well as all the lipids that we talked about in the previous topic. And if you have any questions, please let me know.